Okay, welcome everybody, all my friends, relatives, um, uh, and, and members of the congregation, rabbis, um, even people I don't know, because I think word got around that uh, we're going to be honoring uh, my father, Nisensis, Aloha Shalom, who uh, was well known amongst many people, and, um, and I thought it'd be very appropriate to have a special evening for him. I didn't ever have the uh, occasion to um, have shlok shim from my mother. I really regret it. I was not aware of the custom. But um, it, when people asked me, what is shlok shim? I said, it's a wonderful opportunity to celebrate um, the life of my father. You know, um, I'll, I'll leave the rabbis to explain more significantly what Shloshim is, um, but all I would like to say is it's given me a wonderful opportunity to really appreciate my dad. And um, he was um, a very fine person. I'm going to speak to him sh uh, later. I'm going to ask that we um, have a number of speakers speak before I do. I'm going to keep my thoughts and words to the end. But I just want to say before we start that my dad always wanted to, me for, to make sure that this picture of him was on display at his funeral. It's a picture of himself holding a picture of himself that he took uh, about a half year after liberation. And he's wearing his concentration camp uniform in it. I'm not going to say anything more. My dad will explain it later on because I have a videotape of him explaining the significance of that. I'd like to ask for my first speaker to come and um, share some thoughts and words with you. The rabbi of Sherry Tefillah Congregation. Sherry Tefillah Congregation has been very, very kind and generous to um, our family and to the organization that I work with, Jews for Judaism. Um, we've had programs here for two decades now, and it's um, become home central for the outreach work of Jews for Judaism. And don't be surprised if you watch some of our videos um, online to see this Arna Kodesh behind me as the uh, constant uh, set for many of, of the videos that uh, we have up there for the lectures. Rabbi Lipner has been the rabbi of Sharitz Villa uh, now for going, I think, four years. And he has really done a remarkable job at rekindling life into this congregation. When I first came to this congregation, without exaggerating, maybe I could have seen three baby strollers out in the hall when I would come to shul. And today, easily 33 plus is what you're going to see. The baby strollers coming everywhere. And I think a lot of this has to do with the incredible um, vitality that Rabbi Lipner has brought to Sharitifilla Congregation and bring so many young people to come and enjoy Jewish life in a community that is open and accepting. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask Rabbi Lipton to come. Forgot to tell Julius when we're doing this, you don't have to introduce all the people. It's our cover to be able to give, uh, give words. I know that there's uh, a bunch of people to share stories, personal stories, people who have spent the last years with him and being so uh, critical, developing that respect and honor and relationship and people who knew him back from when, he first, when his parents first came over and the history like that. Uh, Julie speaks about rekindling. So I just want to maybe frame what I think this evening is a little bit about. You know, there's the famous Rashi in the beginning of this week's coming Parsha, Bahaloscha. And the language for Bahaloscha in English, if you see the translation, it's when you light, when you kindle. I believe that's a word Julius just used, to, to kindle neshamos. So he uses the word to kindle, but as we all know from Hanukkah, when we light the menorah, we say lahadlik. We don't say lahaloscha. Uh, to, to bring up, we say to light. That's the proper word. So Rashi is bothered by this word, which seems to be an unnatural word, a little bit out of what you would expect. Explains bringing down the, the Gemara. He says, what is bahalosa, which means to go up? 
So he says the halacha of being yotze, the law to fulfill lighting a candle, is bahaloscha, I'll read it inside, shetzarech lahadlik ad sheteha shalheves ola me'aleha. That you've only fulfilled lighting a candle when the candle can be lit on its own. Meaning that very often there's a match, and when you light with the match, so the candle is lit, but sometimes when you pull the match away, the candle doesn't have the strength to last on its own. And really, that's not called lighting the candle. It's got to be able to stand on its own. And I think uh, the life of Nissen, along with his Eishas Chayel, this could be a, a little bit of a shloshim and a kavod for both of them if we didn't have the opportunity to do it the first time. I think that to be able to live a life that persevered through so much difficulty is, uh, is one thing which I think someone in my door, in my generation, can't even begin to understand and appreciate just surviving uh, and continuing on. But uh, the picture that uh, you, you speak about, you know, spoken about often about how special that was, it was the idea of all the neshamos that didn't necessarily make it through in physical form, but they represented something. And to see in your mishpacha, the mishpacha that he leaves over, and the work that you do, it's bahalosa realizing that those values really, you know that they were important when they were communicated in a way where they can continue on. I think that happened through you. I think it happened through everyone that he touched and came across. They saw that strength and were inspired by his perseverance to go up and to be able to carry on as well. And I think this evening we speak about very often, and I'm sure many have heard the words of an alias neshama, that the neshama should go higher. I think that the words in the Divrei Sikara and the Divrei Torah, the words of memory and the words of Torah that are shared, that represent the life that he lived, should not only be something that's madlik us, that enkindles our desire to be able to aspire to that type of Kedusha, but I'm sure that those words shared in the lives lived and the impact that he had will continue to be a schus that his neshama and their neshamas should continue to rise to the highest heights as well. Thank you, Rabbi Lipner. Um, I'd like to call upon um, another very good friend of our family, um, someone who has been um, a source of strength for us um, at times of weakness, and 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 really a, a wonderful friend and uh, a listening ear. Someone who um, had um, um, uh, an impact on my father as well. I'd like to call upon um, the rabbi of Beis Dov Yosef. Whew. I was afraid I was going to get that wrong. Yeah. Well, by the way, I would like to say one thing. I'm going to be doing this all night because nobody told me the rules of how you do Shloshim, so I'm doing it my way. Okay. But I, I want to take the opportunity to just, you're going to hear the word neshama come up. Some people here don't speak Hebrew. The word neshama means soul. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we still have my father's soul lingering amongst us right now and so the neshama the soul of my father is i feel getting incredible pleasure oh you hear me uh uh yeah, obviously, as the Rav mentioned, Be'aloisko is the key word when it comes to saying Shloishim. We mentioned by the Levi how lightning of candles goes through the whole period of, a, of mourning from the time a person dies till the yard side, till there's always a candle. Every isko we light, Be'aloisko. Be'aloisko is part and parcel of a... Uh, but in this particular Pasha, there's far more than that. You're going to find in the Pasha that there's, there's a tremendous, tremendous different range of topics in the Pasha that seem to be unconnected. But there's one thing, if you look into the Pasha, you're going to listen Shabbat to Kriyat Torah, you're going to see that they're all connected by one thing, traveling going from one place to another. Whether it's the menorah coming up, whether the natives themselves, whether it's the Levine going from being what they were to becoming a separate tribe, whether it's by Hibin Soya Horoin, or the way they traveled, the Hatsoitsois, and the, uh, the way everything was, was a, uh, played out, there's always traveling. There's always movement. Till then, by Miriam, that he stayed. 
but it also involves, involves the law movement. We travel through life, we travel from different places and to different stages. It's by he being soya hoarding, we have to recognize that the machine that pulls us is by he being soya, it's the order. It's our traditions, our title. If you want to stay and really travel properly, it has to be only with the oiling, pulling, conducting us. I uh, didn't know the mission uh, so well, uh, but I uh, was able to pick up uh, on the internet, they placed his testimonies from the Holocaust uh, uh, the last few days, and they uh, I, I, now I seem like I, I actually know him. I, I had some tremendous, tremendous, really, really uh, incredible, incredible uh, yeah, testimonies being said there, being related there. Uh, one of them that really struck me was the last time he saw his father, I believe. It was in a concentration camp next to Riga, remind me, I was stuck, something. Anyway, he was there, and the, uh, it was a working camp, and they, uh, and they made a decree that everybody who was un over 50 had to go to a special section. They're going to deport them to death camp. And they, uh, they took them. Uh, his father was then 52. And they, uh, he, uh, he put his life in danger just to go to that particular place where he was on that section just to see him one last time. And his father got angry at him, and he told him, listen, what are you doing? And he said, then, he's, then he tells him, you know what? Thank God you came. And he said something most incredible. At that time, they didn't feed them anymore. So they were, they were kind of they were just coming apart. So he said something so strange. He says he took parts of his cheek. They were falling apart, right? And they, and they, and they. He says that struck into his mind. What's happening? What's happening? And then he tells him, I want you to remember, listen, I want you to remember my son always. Where we came, family sees. It should not be forgotten. It should keep on going. And then he tells in the beginning of his story that his father was a husband. It was in Dvinsk, in a small shoe. He couldn't remember the name of the shoe or the name of the rabbi. But his father was a husband, and they, uh, he says one of all the things on that, on that tape, of all the stories, the thing that brought tears to his eyes is when they were standing Yom Tev, and he would cover all the seven children with his talis, and they would all be singing together. That voice should not be diminished, should not be standing still. It should be keep on going. It should be by he being soya horoin, because that's what, that's what he wanted. And then, very interesting, he had in his dear two pictures of the Orsameya, the Simche, a coin of Duins, and the Rogi children. The Orsameya he didn't remember well. But he said when he was a kid, right, going to his shoe, he would cross over with the rogi chover, and the rogi chover would tell him good Shabbos as a kid. The rogi chover, of all people who was always immersed in learning, he would tell him good Shabbos. Now, Rabbi Isai, Shloishim is indeed, as Julius mentioned, the end. But what a story. What a Vahib in Soya. It began with a chazan in Duinsk. And you know how many Bealois hoys those Neshames together with Rabbi Skobak, how many Bealois was they have been? How many people have they returned to Yiddishkeit? How many people have become closer because of what Julius is doing? Lighting those Neshames, bringing them back to the proper way. The Bahib in Suya Oron by incredible, incredible journey as it has been. And now it's coming came to his end, the Neshome goes practically now back home.
to Leyoim Shekulo y Chavez, I'm pretty sure, knowing what we know, that the Rogi Shover is once more standing there to greet that the Shomer and telling Nisan Ben Lei, good Shabbos. Thank you very much, Rabbi Bartfeld, for those very, very meaningful words. You know, my father spent um, much of the last six of his years um, in a situation where he really couldn't take care of himself. And um, we brought into his life um, some caregivers to help him um, be able to function, to help him enjoy quality of life, to help him enjoy the community that he was living in at that time, Baycrest Terrace. Um, at one point, he broke his back and he had to live for a year in Baycrest Hospital. When he finally recovered from that, he lived for the remaining three years in the Jewish Home for the Aged Apotex. And the caregivers that took care of him gave him such quality of life, such purpose, such meaning, such enjoyment, companionship, conversation. And I felt at the funeral that when we were giving our eulogies that it was very, very appropriate for me to recognize the caregivers for the incredible self-sacrifice, dedication that they did. Dolores, Divina, Lee, Sita, who also worked for my dad for a while. Incredible, incredible work, but made him happy. And so when I had spoken to Dolores Gavin after the funeral on the phone, she was almost weeping. She said, I feel so bad. There was so much I wanted to say, and there was just no time. And I said, Dolores, I got good news for you and bad news. The bad news is the funeral is over. There's nothing we could do about it. The good news is we have a custom in Judaism called Shloshim, an opportunity for you to share with our community, our family, and our friends a little bit of what you felt was of meaning in your life and my father's. So I'm going to ask Dolores Gavin if you could please come up and say a few words. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all again. Okay, a tribute to Mr. Nissan Sis, who is no longer with us, but his memories lives within our hearts. I was one of Mr. Nissan Sis' caregiver for many years. Mr. Sis was a remarkable man. He was classy, clean, neat, Everything that we do in our care towards him have to be in order, in place, almost perfect. He was a no-nonsense man. He used to tell us so many stories. Some would almost bring us in tears, and some would have us laughing our heads off. That was Mr. That was our Mr. Nissan Sis. Mr. Sis was a lover of flowers. He used to tell us about his lovely flower garden to the many fruit trees in the back of his lovely house. Oh, can't forget the water fountains, one in the front and one in the back. He used to love to sit in the sun. He would sit in there all day if you allow him. Mr. Sis did love life, and he had a good life, and his family loved him very much. Mr. Sis loves his family, his grandchildren, great-grandchildren. They were the love of his life. He would talk about them all the time. So on behalf of Lee Blake, Davina Carrion, and myself, and Sita, Mr. Sis, you will never be forgotten. May his soul rest in peace. We love you. 
Now, Mr. Julius Sis. If love, caring, attention could save your dad, he would be alive today because that you gave to him. Even though you're coming to see your dad, you would call me in the morning just to ask me, how is my dad doing? You were never too busy or tired to attend to your dad's needs. We call you concerning your dad, you would say, I'll be there in 10 minutes. We call you, you're there. We don't call you, you're there. <laughs> Still there. Every step of the way, night and day, just to make sure your dad is okay. You are the best son anyone could ever have. You have outdone yourself. May God continue to bless you and your family. It was a pleasure knowing the Sis family. A big thank you from my family and I. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dolores, and Divina, Sita, and Lee, who couldn't make it here tonight. Um, it really means a lot to us that you are there to give my father, I believe, happiness. Because yes. you put a smile on his face. Yeah. And you know, you have to appreciate how some, so many of us don't realize, we really, really take for granted the caregivers that we entrust to our elderly, not realizing that in the case of my caregivers, they were with my dad 11 hours a day. What did I do? I visited them maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. And they have the opportunity to really, really have a big impact. So thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We really, really, really honestly appreciate it. You know, um, Dolores mentioned how much my father loved his grandchildren. And uh, one of the grandchildren is here tonight, um, Alon Sis, my uh, nephew. And Alon has, if he, oh, by the way, I'm going to be distributing uh, some uh, leaflets later on so that you can go to the website where, um, where Rabbi Bartfeld made reference to some of these videos. Actually, I can just tell you, go to juliassist.com and there's going to be a big thing that says click here to see videos honoring the memory of Mr. Sis. And so to juliassist.com and you'll get some of these videos. But in those, in those uh, videos, um, my father very much expresses his love and uh, for his, his grandchildren. So I'd like to ask my nephew, Alon, wherever you are, to uh, please come. There he is, okay. I'm uh, Nissen's grandson, as Julius introduced me. Um, as this day was approaching, I thought it would be appropriate to watch um, Zadie show I interview, which Julius indicated would be online if you want to take a look at it. Um, I watched it with uh, my wife and my son David and Karen. Uh, we had never seen it before and I thought it would be a good time to do so. For the last 30 days I had so many reminders of him, including pictures which my daughter strategically placed in the high of traffic areas of the house so we couldn't miss it. The interview had been conducted around 22 years ago uh, before I had met my wife. And, and unfortunately, the Zadie that my kids knew has been slowly in decline, either walking very slow with a cane, in a wheelchair, or confined to a hospital bed. I wanted them to get another image and impression of him, one in which they could get a sense of his energy, strength, vigor, gentleness, and his amazing storytelling abilities. The interview itself was around three hours, but we had to stop probably around after an hour and a half, uh, and we planned to watch it at a later time. As a parent, you try and share, expose, and teach your children the things in life that you find so important and meaningful. These things really start asserting the value on you when you reach a certain age, or when life starts slowing down and your perspectives changed. I'm certain that my kids did see a different side to their great-grandfather and got a better appreciation of the sacrifices 
he and the rest of his generation made to give us a better life. Perhaps they did not get as much out of it as I would have liked, but I also know that will come with time, maturity, and perspective. The next day I decided to watch the rest of the interview with just me and my wife. At the end of the interview, I felt a sense of catharsis. Seeing that Zadie in the video brought back so many memories for me, and once again being able to see the animation on his face, his unique facial expressions, and to hear his accent. At the end of the video, Zadie talks about how he went back to where his father was being held, destined for death. His father, horrified that he'd come to this place and risked death himself in order to see him one last time. His father ordered him to save himself, to carry on the cis name, and that's exactly what he did. He talked about coming to Canada with, with no money in his pocket, being a simple Schneidermeister, having three boys, then grandchildren, then living to see his great-grandchildren grow as well. Not only did that give him nachas, but the happiness that it gave him gave us nachas in return. Although my Zaidi's life had many moments of pain and sorrow, it was also filled with simchas and fulfillment, weddings, birthdays, bar mitzvahs, brises. As I was preparing this speech and reflected on his life, I found myself getting a little embittered at my grandfather's life and all the hardships he went through. Perhaps it came through the first draft of this speech, which I read to my wife. She looked at me in horror, as if she was hearing a Stephen King novel, and threatened to divorce me if I read it. It wasn't until I watched this, the video and talked to my wife about his life that I realized that all the nach- uh, realized of all the nachas he had outweighed everything else and made life something to live for, enjoy, and cherish. Zadie appreciated everything. He never took anything for granted, no matter how small or trivial. I'm sure you're going to hear in other speeches tonight uh, the the phrase, everything is going to be okay. In his passing, he taught me that it doesn't matter what you have. What matters is who you have it with. And perhaps in the back of his mind, he knew that, when he said his last words, everything will be okay. Thank you. I'm very fortunate to have in my life um, a friend and a colleague who has known my father for 25 years. And uh, when Rabbi Skobek came to Canada Back in 1991, couldn't help but avoid my dad at our Shabbos table, at Simchas, at, at different affairs, and volunteering at the office. I think Rabbi Skobek had an opportunity to see him many, many times, Pesach Sadarim. And uh, Rabbi Skobek, I think, would be able to paint a different portrait and I, at the same portrait in a different way, a different portrait, but I think Rabbi Skopek has an insight that I would love for him to share about my daddy. Thank you, Rabbi Skopek. Julius' father, Nissen Sis, was born in Dvinsk, 1925, one year before the passing of the city's great Rav, Rav Meir Simcha, the Orsameach. For most of his working life, Mr. Sis was a master tailor. And he made clothing for people. As a Kohen, clothing is a very important piece. The Torah says in the book of Shmos, Exodus chapter 28, that the clothing of a Kohen, the clothing of the priest, was lekavod l'sifaris. 
It was for honor and it was for splendor. The Ramban, Nachmanides, says that the clothing of a Kohen was basically royal clothing, clothing that was supposed to be royal. And the Maral says that kavod, honor, is from the word kaved, weighty, important. We know that Nissen Sis was a Holocaust survivor. And in a way, he wore this as a badge of honor. The fact that it was so important for him to have this photograph displayed at the end of his life and at the Shiva shows in some way how he wore this experience as a badge of honor, kavod. The Nazis, Yamach Shemam, tried to rob us of our humanity. They tried to reduce us to numbers. But Mr. Sis refused to be broken. And he emerged as a person of tremendous strength and nobility. I have very impressionistic memories of seeing Mr. Sis at various times, as Julius just mentioned. And some of the strongest impressions were times when I saw him in passing, maybe when I saw him briefly at Baycrest or when he came to our office to do volunteering. And even though Mr. Sis was very tall, he would often pull himself up to his full height. He would make sure his clothing was just right. He had a regal and dignified bearing, like the priest. Honor and nobility and splendor. He was very proud of his origins. And I remember he would have a twinkle in his eye as he shared with me that he, as a child, was able to see the Ruggachover. He knew where he came from, and it was part of his pride. <clears throat> when I think of Tiferes, the priest's clothing were for kavod, for honor, and teferis, for splendor. And I think of something that's really indeed splendorous. I think of the way that Julius was so totally devoted to his father, fulfilling the mitzvah of kibbutz av. The devotion that Julius had to his father was an incredible testimony to the dad who raised him. Nissen Sis was incredibly blessed to have a son like Julius. He was absolutely steadfast and unwavering in his dedication with tremendous mysterious nefesh to caring for his father. And I think that Julius's caring for his father was a divine service, like the service of the priest serving in the Holy Temple. Our sages explain that honoring parents is very closely related to honoring God. The Kliyakar explains that that's why in the Ten Commandments, even though honoring parents seems to be a commandment that involves interpersonal relationships, it doesn't appear on the side of the tablets that deal with the other interpersonal relationships. It appears on the side of the tablets, the first five commandments 
that deal with our relationship with God. Because ultimately, the Talmud says there were three partners in our creation. Each one of us has our mother, our father, and the Almighty. As Kohanim, as priests, it was very likely that the name Sis or Zis is related to the tzitz that was worn by the Kohen Gadol, one of the special garments worn by the high priest. It was a golden ornament on the forehead that had written on it, Holy to Hashem, Holy to the Almighty. And I think that aside from his incredible service to his father, the other incredible heroic service of Julius, which is again such a dramatic and powerful testimony to his father, was the incredible and is the incredible dedication and self-sacrifice that he has devoted himself to in the life-saving work of Jews for Judaism. I can tell you there are probably not many people, I can count them probably on one hand, not many people who actually know how devoted Julius has been to this holy work. People don't really see it. But a handful of us know that every ounce of his being, every ounce of his strength is given over to the work of Jews for Judaism much in the same way that every fiber of his being was dedicated to caring for his father, especially in the difficult last years of his father's life. And this is truly an incredible testimony to Nisan Sis, Julius' loving father. His neshama should have an aliyah. Thank you, Rabbi Skobak. Um, probably one of the most unique people in my father's life um, showed up in his kitchen one evening in April 1996. When Miriam Sis came into our lives, before we even took her home, we felt that the first place we must take her to is to Zaydi and Bubi. And we took her home from the hospital, drove to my parents' house, and the look of joy on my parents' faces when they saw little itsy bitsy Miriam. Notice I said little itsy bitsy. Her nickname is Mitzi. Can you imagine? Little itsy bitsy Mitzi. <laughs> She was only four pounds, three ounces. Very, very tiny. Just, I could hold her in my hand like that. I sometimes did, and people yelled at me. But I would like my, fa my, my father's favorite granddaughter to come up here and share a few words. So, my daughter, this, this, the theme of my daughter's dress tonight is going to come up twice tonight. Okay? My daughter is wearing Bubi's dress that she wore at my brother's bar mitzvah, a dress that my father made with his own hands on the sewing machine in the basement. And she thought this would be a nice commemoration. I completely forgot about this. And... Um, um, we're not going to show you the video from the bar mitzvah. We can actually put that up on YouTube. But my father made the dress for Bubi. For the, she wasn't a Bubi then for my brother Joseph's bar mitzvah. And I'm going to be referring to that later on this evening. Miriam, it's all yours. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, there's a saying that I heard once, and... Uh, Basically, the bottom line of it is the first, per the first thing you forget about a person is their voice. I can still remember his. And I'm proud of that because it's something that 
makes me feel connected to him still, like he's still here. And uh, when I talk to him, it's like I can, you know, hear him answering. And I love that. Um, my Zadie was someone who had an extremely hard life. And yet, he loved every single minute of it. He lived it. He loved it. And it loved him. And so did all of his friends and his family. And uh, I think that's what life is about, really, is who you have in it and what you make of it. And my Zadie gave me the definition of life. And that's something that I won't forget. Thank you. Thank you, Bubala. Next, I would ask um, somebody who I've known for many, 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 many years, who I regard as, as a, a good friend and um, somebody who we enjoy as a Shabbos guest many, many times at our house, someone with a beautiful voice and a beautiful heart. I'd like to invite the Shamash of Sherry Tfila, Gord Lindsay, to come up. Um, Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hasharet, Malachi Elyon, Mihu Melech, Malachi Amlachim, Hakadosh Baruch Hu. These words created a very unique relationship between me and Mr. Nissan Sis Oliver Shalom. Uh, Rab Asher Turin, he should be well, had asked me to come to the Bakrus Terrace, which is the independent living facility at the West Campus of Baycrest Center, to sing Shalom Aleichem and to make Kiddush and uh, sing some Zmiras every Friday night when the days were long enough for the people there, the residents there, sitting down to have their dinner, their Friday night dinner. He felt there wasn't enough Yiddishkeit, so he asked me to do that, and I did that. And, of course, when I do that, I would walk around the entire dining room, singing Shalom Aleichem, making Kiddush, going all the way around all the tables, and afterwards I would go and greet everyone, wish them a good Shabbos. Sometimes I'd have some challah to give out to them from the head table. And uh, they all appreciated it. But no one appreciated it on anywhere near the incredible level that Nissan Sis Oliver Shalom did. He was like, I, it was to me totally disproportionate. I'm just singing Shabbat like I'm making Kiddush. But he thought that was absolutely over the moon. And he never stopped praising me. I got embarrassed. He never stopped praising me Yet so effusively for me for doing this. Whenever I would come around to the tables, he, when he was there as a resident, he would praise me to the skies. And also when I, when I went over to Julius and Sissus as a Shabbos guest, and he was there, oh, he said, this is a great man. This is a great man. He's a prince. He's a prince. And when I went to the table by him to, to say good Shabbos at the terrace, and, and even at Julius and, and Claire's, He'd take my hand. He'd kiss my hand. He was so over the moon enthusiastic about me doing that, that, uh, that uh, you know, basic mitzvah that I was doing for them. And I still do at, at the terrace. So I wondered about it. I wondered, why, what, is, what is so special about what I'm doing? Here's a man who went through the incredible upheaval and torture and tension and terror and the loss of dear family through the Holocaust, something I can't imagine myself going through and surviving. He went through all of that. He and his wife, Yafashendal Alashalom, came to Canada, built up a whole new life, did all kinds of wonderful things, raising a family, starting a business. And so what is so great about what I'm doing compared to what he has been through 
to what uh, to, to what he has suffered. I just I couldn't imagine him thinking that uh, it was so great what I was doing. I mean, every, every all the Jewish people go do that every Friday night, and that's that was the key to my beginning to understand what it was. I began to get an inkling as to what was going through his mind. Here he was at Baycrest Terrace, living in a room on his own, by himself, no family around him, and uh, as I say, with uh, not too many people were celebrating the Shabbos as uh, as Rabbi Turin. Uh, you should be well, had me do it for them. And I realized what was going on as far as I could guess. What was going on was that after all had been through and all of the real hardships of his life, I was suddenly able to transport him back to the idyllic life and experience that he had before the terrible tumult of the Holocaust, before all of the hardships and the building of his life, before all that, he had a beautiful life. As Rabbi Bartfeld point out, pointed out, his father was a cousin. So you imagine you come home and seven kids were there. You imagine coming home to a beautiful, on Shabbos, Arab Shabbos coming home to a beautiful, the table is set, mommy and daddy are there, all the family is there, the kids are there, and my, the father sings like with a cousin's voice, sings Shalom Aleichem, makes Kiddush, Zmiros, it was incredibly beautiful. It was a beautiful life of peace, security, love, all kinds of wonderful, good things. And I believe that's what he liked about what I was doing. That I brought him back, because I'm, I'm not shy, as you can see. So when I sing out, I give people their money's worth. And when I'm singing Kim Making Kiddush, when I'm singing Shalom Aleichem, there's a lot of, you know... A lot of ahava coming out of me when I do that. And I think that's what the reason was. Therefore, my prayer is that since Nisan loved my singing so much, that he be zoicha, the boy shalom, should let him listen to the real singers, the real malache asharit, the ministering angels. Nisan should have a front row seat to listen to them sing to Hillam, praise to Hashem every day of his, li- of his new life that he wants. The Shama should have an Aliyah. And now I'm going to segue into another task that Julius has assigned me. We have a letter from Israel from the Emeritus Rabbi of Shari Tefillah, Rabbi Moshe Stern. He sent Julius this wonderful email, and Julius has asked me to read Rabbi Stern's thoughts on the occasion of the Shloshim. I feel privileged to be able to share some thoughts in marking the Shloshim observance of Reb Nissen Sis Halavashalom. At the outset, I want to acknowledge the phenomenal devotion and Derek Arendt's Julius displayed towards his beloved father. The last months of Reb Nissen's life were spent struggling to remain alive in the intensive care unit at Humber Hospital. Though Julius was under tremendous pressure to allow the doctors to end all treatment, Julius was relentless in following the halacha and thus preserved the life of his father. I will never forget Julius' phone calls and our discussions of the halacha during these critical times. My wife and I so admired Julius' determination and Amud Hashem that so inspired us and should be a lesson to others. Time and again, when the doctors proclaimed his end, Reb Nissen would rally and continue his valiant fight to live. Reb Nissen Sis was a Holocaust survivor, and his passing is again a reminder that the survivors are diminishing, and it will be up to the next generation to keep the memory of those horrific events alive and shared with our children and grandchildren. Reb Nissen experienced numerous tragedies in his life, the passing of his wife, Helena Aleh Sholem, the loss of children, but he always maintained a positive outlook and never displayed bitterness or ill feeling. His motto was, as has been said, 
זה עבד זין גוט, everything will be well. He was a proud Jew, and I cherish the time we spent conversing in Yiddish. He was a big man with an even bigger heart. He loved his family and had a special bond with his grandchildren. He had a great influence on Julius, and considering the Kiruv work Jews for Judaism is performing, Reb Nissen will surely be welcomed into a special place of honor in Gan Eden. This past Shabbat, We read in the Torah the Birchat Kohanim, the priestly benediction, a blessing Reb Nissen would be familiar with inasmuch as he was a Kohen. May the blessing of peace be Reb Nissen's eternal reward as he is now reunited with the families he lost in the Shoah. And since then, may his memory inspire us all to strive to perfect our personal commitment to Torah and mitzvot, With great respect, Rabbi Moshe Stern. You know, I shared at the Shiva um, the remarkable story of Achnachas Orchim that was bestowed upon my parents when they came to Canada, my father and uh, My mother and my brother, they came here with nothing. And um, my father got a job on Spadina, had a misfortune or, or, or fortune to, uh, to find an apartment, but it was in Sunnyside. So for him to get to work on Spadina, it was uh, an hour and, a, hour and a half walk every morning to and from Spadina. And uh, after his first week working there, being a Jew from... Vince Latvia. He was invited to a meeting of Lithuanian Jews. And there he, he was invited to speak about what he had gone through. After which, a woman came up to him and said, you're going to move into my house. Who was this woman? It was Rebetzin Berenson, the wife of Rabbi Berenson. And she expressed resolute determination that my father could not say no She invited my father to stay as long as was necessary, not to worry about food, not to worry about rent. And my parents ended up staying in their home for six months. And had it not been for the incredible hospitality and generosity of Rabbi and Rabbitson Berenson, I don't know what would have been the, the fate of my, my, my parents, but I do know that, that because of the incredible love and kindness that was expressed by them, We were very, very grateful to be able to have Rabbi Robinson Barents in our life, but we also feel like they were part of our family because coming to the, coming to the new country without any relatives, everybody became an aunt and an uncle. So Robinson Barents to us became Auntie Rivka. And so we have Auntie Rivka's daughter here, Evelyn Mandel, Havala, as we used to call her, to um, share a few thoughts about... My daddy. Can you come up, Halaba? Halaba? Havala. I made a boo boo. About 60 years ago, I remember coming home from school. I remember coming home from school and finding a family in the house. What's going on? This tall, red-haired, freckle-faced man and his wife, a beautiful Helena, and a little baby, three months old, Yossi. And I said, what's going on? What's... Anyways, the, my mother invited them to come live with us, and we got to be very close. I remember my mother used to warm up a bottle for Yossi in the middle of the night so that Helena and Nissen didn't have to wake up. And I remember one incident that Nissen and I were on a bicycle and around the Spadina Circle, there used to be a Borden's Dairy, I don't know if it's still there, and the policeman stopped us. We both were so scared, him for sure. I was laughing, I thought, what's the big deal? But anyways, it turned out it was okay. And I'm just grateful that I had such wonderful parents who could take in 
people, and they're just like family to us. Sorry, I'm not used to talking as much as Julius is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kavala. At around the same time that Rabbi and Rebetzin Berenson took my parents under their wing, another couple rose up, Ma and Pa Erkovich. I don't, they became Ma and Pa for our family. Our grandparents and their children became our aunts and uncles, Uncle Harry, Auntie Penny, Auntie Rosie, the, 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 we, had, we had family. We're not so sure what the definition of auntie and uncle really meant, but they, they were aunties and uncles. And one dear, dear friend of mine is uh, a part of that family, Michael Hart, a grandson of Mom Par Arkovich. So I'd like, Michael, if you could come forward and just share some of your reflections on, on my dad and, and your family. I'm not a rabbi, <laughs> not a Talmud Chacham, not a cantor. So I'm, I'm, I really would just like to, um, just like to honor Nis and Sis tonight. That's all I want to do. So, and uh, Julius called me and he said, uh, uh, you know, I should speak for five minutes. I said, uh, you know, I thought to myself, geez, the idea that you could capture the life of a person in five minutes is just, just ridiculous. And um, it's outrageous. And then a person that was extraordinary, like Nis and Sis, it's um, um, it's it's not possible. It's uh, there's no possibility of success. So, uh, but I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to endeavor to try. I'm going to try to do justice uh, to Nis and. Uh, um, uh, I, I called him Nis and the Strong. He was uh, he was uh, uh, probably the strongest person I ever met. So Nis and Hagibor. Um, Probably going to say that a few times tonight. So uh, the, um, this is, uh, uh, you know, people. Um, uh, most of uh, uh, most people didn't know uh, Nis and uh, Miss Mandel does, but uh, I, I knew him since I'm, 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 I'm a, a, an infant. Um, anyway, anyone in, with an interest in genealogy uh, will tell you that there's usually one person in each family that has an interest in uh, family history, and in my family, that's me. And the first thing uh, you do when you're looking for, uh, when you're trying to uh, research your family history is you speak to the oldest members of your family and you, uh, you uh, write down the living memory. So, uh, so you seek answers from, I, saw, uh, I remember uh, many years ago in the late 70s, I asked, or maybe middle 70s, I asked my grandfather, his name was Isaac Yurkovich, I asked him uh, about the family and, uh, and he, you know, and I wrote it all down, you know, he, he came from... Uh, uh, Ukraine in, uh, you know, 1923 and um, whatever. And, and at some point I said, uh, can you explain to me how we're related to uh, Nissen and Helena Sis? And uh, he just lit up. Uh, you know, he just lit up and, and it became clear very quickly that in reality we weren't related uh, blood re relatives, but uh, we were to uh, refer to them as family. So um, allow me to explain. Uh, Nissen and, uh, and, and mine's more bi biographical. Than everybody else's, I think. Anyway, so uh, allow me to explain. Nissen and Helena came to Canada after the war in the late 1940s. Uh, my aunt Rose, um, who's also born in 1925, uh, like Nissen, uh, he met them, and, and of course uh, she schlepped them to my uh, my Bubby and my Zeta uh, Isaac, my uh, my Bubby Sura and my, uh, my my Zeta Isaac. In short order, the Sisses and the Yurkoviches were indeed family. The Sis family always referred to my grandparents as Ma and Pa. And uh, both of these families had something in common. They didn't have any relatives here in Canada. They didn't have any aunts, they didn't have any uncles, they didn't have any cousins. Um, the Sis family, because they were all murdered. And, um, um, and my, uh, my family, because they, they were the only ones that left, uh, the only families that left of my, gran my grandparents. So uh, they were the only, uh, you know, they had, um, and they saw each other as, uh, as mishpacha, as a family. Uh, some of my earliest memories are, uh, are sitting around uh, tables listening to Nissen relate stories of unimaginable horror. Uh, the magnitude 10 nightmare uh, that he and Helena 
had, uh, had gone through in Europe, uh, the great toll and trauma that was exacted uh, from Nissan and Helena's, uh, it's, it's, it's utterly ungrounding. It's, um, uh, their lives had to endure such darkness, such unfathomable evil, uh, but, was, but Nissan was uh, just about the strongest person that uh, the good Lord ever made. Nissan was unsinkable. There's another word, I, it, it's been on the tip of my tongue for days now, and I cannot come up with it, even now. He was um, unsinkable. It's the best I come up with. I can... No, that's not it either. But, <laughs> but, but thanks for playing the game. Okay, anyway, Nissan, Nissan was uh, a gibor, and Nissan was greater than the whore. Um, if I was to relate some of the, uh, the stories, the experience that Nissan Sis endured, even the strongest of you, would be in tears. Um, I would be in tears. And, um, you know, it was, it was, and I heard those stories many times. I can't even imagine how many times you heard those stories. Anyway, uh, the angels, I'm sure, would shed tears too. But again, Nissan was so strong. And whatever amount of strength that you're, in, uh, you're, you're conjuring in your mind, add more joules, add more newtons, add more ergs, add more gigawatt, gigawatts. Uh, Nissan uh, wasn't just strong for himself. Nissan also carried Helena, his Bisherto. So Helena really wasn't, was unable. I don't want to get into it, but she was really unable. And, and, and it was okay. Uh, she sang. She painted. She couldn't stand it if you weren't eating. And, um, and, and she, was, uh, she was beautiful and regal. Somebody else used that word, regal. She was regal. I always thought of her as, uh, I always thought uh, she was sort of a royal uh, princess, maybe. Uh, meanwhile, though, Nissen did the heavy lift. He went to work. He attended to his three sons. He was a gardener of renown. And one thing was constant. There was no rest for Nissen Sis. He was so strong, though. Nissen and the Sis family are a metaphor for the Jewish people in the 20th century. Nissen was born in Latvia in 1925. Uh, and he was one of seven children. He had five brothers and one sister. Uh, the peaceful segment of Nissan's life ended in 1940 when Latvia lost its independence uh, to the Soviets, and Latvia went from bad to infinitely worse when the Nazis entered in 1941. Um, that's sort of like burned in my engrams, you know, he would talk about that. Uh, within a very short time of Nissen's uh, arrival at the death camp, there were only himself and his father, uh, Joseph. His father's name was Joseph. They were left alive. And I heard the story of Nissen's father's demise many times, and I'm unable to write it here or even attempt to relate it to you. Suffice to say that at war's end, Nissen was the sole member of his family among the living. It is an exercise in incompleteness to talk about Nissen without talking about Helena. Helena and Nissen met in a displaced persons camp, Helena was a world-class beauty, and Nissen was handsome, and of course, Nissen was so strong. While in the DP camp, they had their first of three magnificent sons. Um, Joseph uh, Lieb, y Yossi. He was born in December of 1947 in Munich. Julius uh, was born in 1951 here in Toronto, and Sheridan in 1952 also here in Toronto. My family called them Joey, Julie, and Sherry. I have nothing but magical memories of these three young lions and, their, and the Yiddish and Nachas that uh, they brought to Helena and Nissen. As I said, the story of the Sis family uh, in the 20th century is the story of the Jewish people in the 20th century. One son went to war for Israel. I want to say something about that too. It's one of my sharpest memories. I was 10 years old. Joey and Devorah, his new wife, they came back to Toronto. And we were in the backyard, and, uh, and uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember who made the speech. They were talking about Joey, and it's a great line. It's 1970. Do you, I don't, do you remember this? Do uh, you remember this? So uh, I don't remember who said it. They said, you know, the Six-Day War would have been nine or ten days if it wasn't for Joey. <laughs> he never forgot that line. I use it all the time. Today, by the way, is June 6th. That's unbelievable. And Friday, I had Joey's, uh, Joey's son and beautiful uh, Aloni and, and Sarah came for a Shabbat, and it was Helena's birthday. It was, uh, it was you know, very shocking to me. Anyway, so um, this, um, Joey, uh, one son uh, went to war for Israel. One son was consumed by depression 
and one son became Torah observant. Um, of particular note, Nissen and Helena have glorious descendants too. On a side note, uh, those are some pretty giant shoes to fill. I have such beautiful memories of how happy, how elated, and how life-affirming the wedding of Alona and Sarah was. Uh, Helena, and, uh, Helena didn't live much longer after, not, not so much longer after that, but she was beautiful that night. Um, Helen and Nissa were so happy, and I have to make mention of their wonderful children, David and Karen. Uh, David and Karen. Beautiful. On a side note, we believe that uh, we are in closest proximity to God during the Ni'ilah prayer and under our chuppahs. Uh, so people always pass people prayers and say, you know, like, could you pray for this person? Could you pray for whatever? Could you, could you, uh, and uh, so after my wedding, uh, my wife and I, uh, we compared. Uh, we were driving down to the hotel, it was like two in the morning, and I said, what did you pray for? And she said, uh, I prayed that, uh, or she said, I prayed that uh, Claire and Julius would have a baby. And I said, I prayed for that too. And um, um, I can't take full credit, but... but uh, but I always shep, uh copious amounts of, uh, of nechat uh, from hearing about the exploits of Miriam. Sadly, Sherry left this world without uh, having children. Um, I remember how crazy a time that was for Nissen and Helena. It was, such a cl- it was so uh, close to uh, your wedding, um, to Julius and Claire's wedding, and um, so it was like frenetic. Nissen was so strong, though. Um, I guess at this point... Uh, the point is that uh, if you ever get a chance to ask Nissen about his grandchildren, you would see what uh, it, was le- it was like being in the presence of a 10,000-watt light bulb. Uh, when I was growing up, each Yisker, on Yom Kippur, Pesach, Shavuot, and Shemini Yetzirah, my mother Panina, of blessed memory, would always light an extra Yurtzeit candle. Um, she taught me, uh, she taught us, that there were so many people that don't have anyone to light for them. And to remember them, and I encourage everyone to uh, take this tradition on. Um, every time we light Yurtzeit candles since I was a kid, I always think, had the Germans uh, made their uh, memories be erased? Uh, had their way, these extra Yurtzeit candles would have been for, uh, for Nissen and Helena too. Nissen Sitz was a big, strong man. I was blessed to have known him. Um, in Tractate Megillah, uh, it says that a diamond of great value may be lost, but uh, it's still in the world. It's only lost to its owner. Uh, while it turns out that John Donne was uh, right and each man's death does diminish, it also heartens me to think that Nissen, uh, Hagibor, and Helena are together, and Nissen is reunited with Sherry and those that were so violently taken from him. May his great Nisham have an Aliyah. So um, I want to take a few minutes just to um, reflect a little bit on certain aspects of my father. First of all, the incredible pleasant memories growing up, the wonderful Shabbat meals we would have together as a family, the times he would surprise me and my brothers with ice cream cones when we least expected it, my mother's little variety store on St. Clair was called Helen's Smoke Shop. Nobody calls anything a smoke shop nowadays, but a little Helen's Smoke Shop on St. Clair. It was a business failure, but they tried it for two years. My father teaching me how to sew. I was able to eventually sew uh, shirts and I remember my first bottle of beer working in the garden with my dad on a hot July day and I'm goes into the garage and opens up a beer and he looks at me and goes, the little step is in my bizzle? I never had a beer before. I always thought the smell was terrible, but that day I was so thirsty. It tasted pretty good. I remember going to my dad. Some of you may have heard this story. When I was 12 years old, telling my dad, I, I really like a bicycle. And he said to me, you want a bicycle? No problem. Get a job, make the money, and get a bicycle. <laughs> Two months later, I had a nice red bicycle. Two years later, he came to me when he was moving up to Steels and Bathurst. He needed money to pay for the appliances for the new house he was moving in. Sure, no problem, Dad. I was 14. He taught me, he taught me 
to work. You want something, you strive, you work for it. You set goals, you achieve them. Nothing in life is going to be a handout. At least if it is, you're not going to appreciate it. You appreciate it if you have to work for something. I remember, I remember very fondly my experiences in shul with my dad. They were very vague, but I remember sitting in, in, a, in a pew like this at Sher Shemayim on St. Clair, and he'd be with his finger, his big, he had huge hands, showing me where we were in the sitter, or if we were following along in the Chumash. One of my sweetest memories, it's unbelievable that I have this memory, is sitting on his shoulder on Simcha's Torah with a flag and an apple on it, dancing around, a little three, it's in my head, I, I can't forget it. A beautiful memory. What I'd like to do is give you a little bit of memory of my father. Um, and I'm going to take you back in time to uh, my brother's Yossi's bar mitzvah. And I want to play a, just a two minute clip of my father's speech at that bar mitzvah. My dear relatives, friends, distinguished guests, it's one of my greatest honor to stay in front of you all, to see you like sisters and brothers, not like guests, participating to my greatest simcha in my life. After I've seen my son today saying his master in a shul from a thousand people participating for Darnan. And each of one of them was the greatest honor to come out from the exit and to shake hands and to wish him a lot of naches in the years to come. My dear son, it's one of my greatest honor to stay in front of you after a day which you said I'm after, which that's what I was praying for. That's what my father teached me, and I gave my best to you. I hope in the years to come, we should have a lot of naches from you, and you should be an example from all the Jewish families. They should go to the Hebrew Jewish school, and they should learn how Jewish boys have to get education. I hope that you go on from now on as far as you can go to reach the best of your ability. I would like to express my deeply thanks to all my guests and friends for participating to this great Simcha. Thank you very much and a lot of for you all. It's a taste of who my father was. You know, it's a shame that we didn't quite give him all the naches he could have gotten. We've, we, we, we weren't able to maybe necessarily give my father everything he hoped for. I know that I disappointed him greatly for a period of his life. And uh, well, one of the interesting things that comes through in his, in his little speech there at my brother's bar mitzvah was his knowledge and knowing of the importance of a Jewish education. But what, what, what I've come to understand now is that that education, as important and as beautiful as it is, really pales in comparison to the education that a child receives when they see their parents live Judaism and make Judaism come alive in their own homes. When they become Jews for Judaism, make Judaism real and meaningful and vital in their own lives and homes. And so it's something that, that I, 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 I realize in a way is an impetus for me. Is this, I've, my father inculcated into me that, that uh, passion and that um, uh, fire for, for Yiddishkeit. But I just, I, if the, the one message that I would like to, my father's words to portray is that we should all uh, take our faith seriously and make Judaism much, much more meaningful. Um, I want to just say two more things. 
Um, first of all, um, several people have made mention of, of my um, commitment to trying to take care of my father and to make sure that he was well taken care of. Somebody shared with me a, a, a few words that uh, I agreed to read, and I think it's very inspiring. Kabed et avicha et timecha. It's one of the commandments from the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. The word honor, kabed, has the same root as the word kaved, heavy. It is so much easier to honor your parents when they are well and in a position to give you that one benefits from. But when they become older and frail, that burden becomes very heavy. Therefore, we are commanded to honor our parents always and throughout the course of our lives, no matter what. It was my privilege and honor to be there for my daddy, for my tati, my dad, Nis and sis, that's all. He spent so many years taking care of his family and instilling in us our Jewish heritage. I believe his efforts were tireless and very, very well worth it. I'd just like to conclude with a few thoughts. I sent out invitations by email to tonight's Shloshim. Nobody ever told me what you do and you don't do with one of these affairs. And maybe I'm glad I didn't ask anybody's opinion. So I'm going to read you the words of the email I sent out to the uh, prospective invitees and some of the responses I got back. Dolores was with me the day that this took place. My father was a Holocaust survivor. He was the only one of his entire family to survive Hitler's hell. In 1948, with his wife, Elena, also a Holocaust survivor, and my oldest brother, Joseph, he came to Canada penniless to find work and rebuild a new life. My dad inculcated in me a lot of positive values. To be proud as a Jew, to appreciate those around me, to embrace my passions, and to work hard to achieve my goals. And although I made some really big mistakes in my life, I was always assured that he loved me. My father spent the last nine months of his life in the intensive care unit in Humber River Hospital. On August 5th, he was admitted with congestive heart failure and pneumonia. Soon, he couldn't breathe on his own and needed a ventilator. Then a tracheotomy was inserted into his throat, disabling his ability to speak. He had to have a feeding tube because he could no longer swallow. Then he had kidney failure and to go on dialysis. And there was more, but I'll spare you the agony. And although he could not talk, he would smile and tell the caregivers and the nurses, I love you, by carefully mouthing the words. Then he would often blow them kisses. But most inspiring was what happened two months before his passing. While I was sitting with Dolores, his caregiver, his trach tube got twisted briefly. And for a quick moment, it enabled him to utter just one sentence to us. It was the last sentence I remember him saying to me. He turned to us, to me and Dolores, and he said, Everything is going to be okay. Amazing. But that was my dad. No matter how tough things got, he had a positive attitude and hope. Everything is going to be okay. Became the theme of our shiva and the Shloshim as well, of Nissan Sisitzal. I know that my dad would love for you to be encouraged by his last verbal message to me. This in spite of all the problems, difficulties, and hardships we may face, everything is going to be okay. You gotta believe it. Those were the words of the email I sent, and I got so many email responses. I'm just gonna read you uh, four of them. One email says, Yesha Koach, and thank you for sharing such inspiring words. They're very meaningful to me personally as I am myself going through a tough time and the encouragement couldn't have been better time. Another person writes, Mr. Sis was a loving and supporting father, a tolerant and non-judgmental man of faith who lived what he believed and passed those lessons to his family. Keep faith in Hashem, be a good person, have goals, work hard, keep a positive attitude, care for and help others. Third person writes, 
You gave those of us who did not have the opportunity to meet your father a wonderful and accurate picture of his warm, caring, positive, and inspiring person that he was. Despite his own pain and suffering when he was ill, he focused on and cared about others, encouraged them, and supported his dear, precious family and those around him, including his caregivers. Last comment. Your father's reassuring words, everything is going to be okay, express so much about faith, attitude, love, and character. They are indeed words to live by. So everything is going to be okay. As long as we're together, thank you so much.